Hello, welcome to the LFC Women's Show. It's me, Chris Brack. We're back for a new season. I'm here with Philip Small from, from the Anfield Rap. And I'm here with Emma Sanders from the Beeb. How are we doing? Yeah, good, good. thank you. Jolly good, jolly. I haven't spoke for ages. Well, yeah, it's like half a year, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You've, you've, you've been seeing me stressed on the, on the sideline, haven't you, Philippa? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll just end the show then, and that's it. <laughs> so, so, right, so new season's upon us. Uh, so we're filming this just a few days for Arsenal away. So, you know, nice easy start for Liverpool, you know. Just thanks for, the, thanks for that, you know. Um, but all changed. Se- seven new players in, an absolute ruck of players out. So, Emma, how have we sort of seen the, the squad? I mean, I, I can't lie. Stengel going is pretty heart wrenching. You know, that is your guaranteed goal scorer that we know can play this level and can score goals. So it's also a bit exciting because, you know, new strikers and maybe a new way of playing. Yeah, obviously Stengel going was was a big blow, wasn't it? Like you say, top scorer last season. She just absolutely ran the show. Um, almost single-handedly won of those games against Chelsea. So, um, yeah, I think I think it was a, a real blow to lose her, but not overly surprising. She's always been a little bit homesick and she doesn't really tend to stay too long at clubs that she's been at before. So um, I think Liverpool kind of knew that was the situation right at the beginning of the summer. And I actually think it was really impressive work actually by the recruitment team and obviously Matt Beard and his staff to go out and get Sophie Roman Hogg, who's um, a really um, sort of, promising young player and actually there's a lot of excitement around her there was a lot of excitement around her before the world cup maybe not widely known in terms of kind of over here in england but certainly in europe she was always highly rated and anyone who watched the world cup would have seen obviously her hat trick that she scored um for norway so yeah i think she's a really good player and i'm really happy um in terms of her coming in but obviously it's her first season she is young she's got some big boots to fill so i think it's probably important as supporters to not kind of compare the two because they are very different players. And I think um, naturally when you get someone in who is who is a different player, it is going to have an impact. That could be a positive one. It could be a negative one. I think we'll have to wait and see on that. But in terms of on paper, um, I'm really happy with her. And then, yeah, I think we've, we've added some strong additions elsewhere as well. I like what we've done in terms of um, the defence, bringing Jenna Clark in and uh, Grace Fisk. I, I'm a huge fan of Grace Fisk as well. Obviously, huge experience in the WSL with West Ham, um, being one of their key players for for a couple of seasons now. So, I think she was a really good player to bring in. So, I think I think we strengthened at the back. Um, obviously, added a little bit more depth in midfield as well. Um, but I just I, I worry slightly still that I would have liked to have seen a, maybe at least another winger come in that's that's ready and raring to go. Like we've signed Mia Enderby, who's, who's a good, promising young player. Um, and I, but as I say, I think. There's a lot of responsibility on on obviously new signing Sophie Roman Hag up front. And I just think, you know, Mel Lawley's coming back from an injury. Leanne Kern has obviously been out for the entire season, still not fit. Shanice van der Sandem wasn't really fit last season as well. Um, Yana Daniels, we've obviously given her one year extension for, but you know, ideally she's not really someone that you want starting every game in the WSL. So um, yeah, I think that's the only area for me where I'm a little bit worried that one injury could could slightly tip things over the edge a little bit, but yeah, certainly midfield defence and and in the goalkeeping department, I think we've we've gone out and strengthened. So um, overall, for me, it's an eight out of ten in the transfer window. I'm I'm really happy. Good, Philippa. How are you sort of seeing the uh, the squad rebuild? Because you know, I mean, we we do see these quite big rebuilds. Most summers in most of your sell sides, it's quite a, a usual summer for most sides. But you know. It's, Seven, you know, brought the average age of the squad down. Um, but I think we've kept the experience sort of at the front and at the back. And I think we've gone for a quite more of a youthful midfield, which, to be honest, our midfield has to do a lot of work, especially if we had stuck to the system we do, which is, I think we've played 5 2 3 a few, a few times. But do you think we may see a bit of a formation switch with, with these additions? Um, I'm not sure about a formation switch. I think. I think our main strength last season, anyways, particularly from January onwards, was our midfield. Um, I think you saw a really good blend there with Fuka Nagano coming in in January. Um, you know, she'll have had a full pre-season now. She'll have had last season to get used to to the team as well and, and what Matt Bird is expecting from her. You know, she'll have picked up the language a little bit more as well, I think. So, um, and then we had, you know, Missy Bowen... Uh, 
Kerry Holland just ahead of her. Um, I think it's going to be interesting to see how Matt goes because I think we've brought in a really good midfielder as well in Hobinger. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm really interested to see what he does at Arsenal. Um, you know, is he going to try and kind of keep it nice and solid and try and hit them on the break? I think that's probably the only way we can really approach that game. Um but I, I'm not too sure what his mix is going to be. Is he going to go with players who are used to playing together or is he going to try and, you know, throw one of the newbies in there? Um, I mean, at the back, I absolutely love Grace Fisk. I, you know, I watched Squad Goals, I think it was, that was on the BBC as well um, mm. a few years ago when, when Matt was there. And she really stood out for me as quite a mature uh, person even though she was really young on there, uh, you know, she stood out as one of like the main characters within that squad. And I think, you know, it was a quite a signing really. I think it was something that when, when I heard that she was going to be leaving West Ham, I was like, I really hope we're in for her because, you know, she's at that right kind of age profile as well at 25 where she's coming in. She's had that experience within the WSL. Um, and, you know, she has been a mainstay in that West Ham defense for the last couple of seasons, like uh, Emma said, Um so yeah, I'm I'm really excited. Um and it's it's gonna be interesting to see if Matt throws in Tegan Micah uh from the start as well, or if he if he sticks with Lawsey. I think we've got two very solid goalkeepers there now. Um you know, it, it's gonna be interesting to see who comes out on top in that kind of like battle. Um so yeah, I'm I'm excited about Sunday. I'm not necessarily saying that I'm expecting anything from the game, but I you know, I just want us to be competitive and let's see if we can get something out of it yeah i mean in terms of the two keepers they're both also very progressive goalkeepers so it's a bit of a like for like in terms of stylistically so we don't have a dramatic style change um no matter which which keepers in i mean i mean the, the arsenal game's going to be obviously tricky i mean arsenal are always in and around the title hunt they've added uh russo to the side probably the only thing that's a little surprise arsenal is going out of the champions league earlier than yeah. probably expected yeah, that was a huge blow for them. Absolutely massive blow. Um, obviously, lots of people, I think this is a whole other conversation, but a lot of people discussing um, first, you know, the scheduling, how soon you have to play a Champions League qualifier after the end of the World Cup is obviously um, such a short turnaround. Alessia Russo, for example, only had six days off after England reached the World Cup final. So um, that in itself is a problem. And then some people like would like to see the Champions League expanded because Juventus, another big club, went out as well in the qualifying rounds. But I think that's a whole other discussion. Personally, I think that Arsenal squad was was more than capable of of qualifying um, for the group stages. So um, yeah, they'll be really disappointed. It might help them in terms of their WSL actually because obviously that's one less competition in which they'll have to rotate for. Um, they showed last season that. You know, they were competing on all fronts. They reached the Champions League semi-final, obviously did well in the Cups again. Um, and they had some seriously damaging injuries, which is still going to impact them this year. Um, five ACL injuries in the space of a year. Um, so at that one club, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, so, yeah, so they're still missing a couple of key players, but they've spent the money. Um, we saw them spend money in January. They've spent the money again this summer, big time. So, um yeah, they've they're, they're going to be right up there, and I, I think they're going to be absolutely fine. And for me, this is probably their best chance to win to win the league title since they won it in twenty nineteen. We'll come to your predictions in a bit because you've got an article out about that, so which has caused a bit of a stir. So we'll, we'll go through that in a bit. Um, do you think we're getting close to the point now where, with the women's game growing, you know, the quality across Europe, are we getting that that stage? Or there's probably got, there's probably should be a second European tournament. You know, a women's version of the Europa League? Uh, I, I, I think we're, we're far too early for that. Far, far too early, in my opinion. I think we need to expand the Champions League first. Um, and then I think we need to just see that kind of develop and and really sort of make that a consistently elite competition before we even think about a second one. Um, so, yeah, for me, it's, yeah, I think we're a long way off from that. That's just that. That's just that idea. That fell down the <laughs> box. Uh, but speaking also of the squad, uh, we did have some uh, contract extensions as well. Um, probably the big one, as Philippa knows, because she had to put with my messages of panic, was a uh, Kerry Holland extended, which um, relaxed me a bit because I was genuinely concerned. You know, a lot of the big clubs be sniffing around it, which I'm sure they were to try and 
taken away from Liverpool. So I think getting someone like Kerry Holland, you know, keeping Missy Bowe to a longer contract, they're sort of key cornerstones of the club that you want to keep around, which I'll be honest, historically, we haven't been very good at doing that. So, you know, it's again another positive step in the right direction for Liverpool is not only building the squad, but keeping key players. I think that's the thing. It's about investing in the right players that you've got at the club with the right attitude and, you know, the ability as well. Um, you know, for me, Kerry Holland, since she signed for the club, has probably been our standout midfielder. Um, she's certainly somebody who I didn't want to see us lose in the summer. And, you know, you can understand why the top clubs were sniffing round her. Um, I think it says a lot about her, to be honest, that she's committed to Liverpool again, because I think. I always say this, you can look at it and you can say, you know, she for me, she's pretty much guaranteed to start for Liverpool, for this Liverpool side. She is a mainstay within there. She goes to a top four side in the WSL. That isn't necessarily the case. Um, and I think that a, a player of her quality should be playing every week. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm just really, really pleased that she has committed to the club. Same for Missy Bo. I mean, I think I think Missy's kind of like a little bit of a different story because obviously she's a Liverpool fan. You know, she's come all the way through uh, the academy and, um, you know, she wears a heart on her sleeve. Um, what I kind of want to see from Missy Bo now, I know she's like the captain in the under-23s, I think it is now for mm. England. I want to see, uh, you know, starting to knock on that door of the, the senior side as well. And I think in order to do that, I think, you know, the consistency of her performances, you know, the second half of last season, I think she was getting there. I want to see mm -hmm. that continue and see her improve and, and get that consistency up at a level where, she, you know, you can't really ignore her. You know, there's a couple of spaces within that that England setup, I would say, where there's players who are, who are in the squad, but not necessarily getting game minutes. And I think, you know, she's more capable of of kind of taking that place and then impressing, you know, in the in the training sessions, etc., with the the full England squad. So, um, I think it's it's really really good that the club are investing in those those players. Um, you know, that are a good age as well. Um, I think Kerry Holland's 25, 26 as well. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, they're all at a a good age. Um, that we can build a side around, and you know, if we can keep them at the club for four or five years, you know, let's see where we can go. Wouldn't a lot by then, Philip. That's, that's the plan, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's right, but yeah. But I mean, look at the squad. I mean, we, Philip, and you and me always have this conversation when we're sat in the Clippers before a season starts. Is we always sort of talk about, you know, what do we know definitely about the squad and what do we hope? My only slight concern as well is there's probably a bit more this year of what we hope will happen because of the changes. You know, it's, you know, we hope um, South Harvey is going to be the leading goal scorer. We hope Tasha Flint is also going to be that. Uh, impact, but we don't we don't know that yet because we haven't seen them fully at this level really sort of do it yet. But I think what we do know, which I think it gives confidence, is the solidity at the back. Um, you know, we've got a proven goalkeeper in Rachel Laws. We've got an exciting goalkeeper just brought in who I think got a push. And I'm I'm like Emma. I'm intrigued to see how that competition goes because I think whoever gets the number one jersey knows they've got to be on their toes because there's a quality person behind them really really pushing them. Um, I think the only, the only sort of query I've got is if you ask me who Liverpool's midfield is now, I'd say it's Missy Bow, Kerry, and Fuka. That's your starting yeah. three. I still think there are question marks or queries about the three new players because I don't know enough about the new new signing. I can say that, and the other two are quite young, so we're still sort of learning how they are. But I think we're seeing bits of them. That's my I, outside looking in. I genuinely think that it's going to be three from four. Um, as starting players, and for me, that's that's Hobinger that's that's knocking on that. I think, I think she's she's an excellent player. I'm really excited to see her come in, and I think it's you know it's about other players as well raising their levels because I think to keep her out of the side, they're going to have to, you know, to to up their level as well. And I think that's that's only a good thing. Um, my concern, I think, at the moment is where the goals are coming from. And, you know, that's partly in, due to us losing Stengel. I think the players that we've got at the club who've been here last season as well, we don't know if we can rely on them because they've been out injured for a lot of the time. Um, mm. So for me, 
you know, that that is a, an issue for me. Um, and then the others that have come in, so Sophie Roman Hogg, I'm really excited about her. But as Emma says, we need to give her that time to get settled into the side and to for the players in and around her to get used to her as well. Um, and then Tasha Flynn, I think who's she's had a great pre-season for me. Mm. Um, I've been quite impressed with her and I think she's she's performed beyond what I thought you know, when, when we signed her that I thought she was capable of. Um, and maybe that's just on me not having watched enough of her. Um, and I am excited about Maya Hen- Enderby, but again, it's a bit of an unknown for me at the moment. And we need to see how they do, you know, when they're coming up against WSL sides in competitive games, not just in pre-season friendlies where people are trying things out, but in those competitive games. Um so I'm I'm excited, but I am also still a little bit wary of the fact that you know we're not the finished article. Um, you know, it is still a work in progress, and we we need to just see how it goes over the first few games. Yeah, I mean, how did you sort of feel about preseason in general? Because I mean, Liverpool they played, they played Leicester's last game and they played Birmingham first game, but in between that, it was your Man United, your Man City's, Atletico Madrid, you know, big tests, you know. PSG was the other one who I think we lost on penalty shootout. I think Atletico was like a two-one, so looks were, were close. But how would you sort of see it? Is it is it better to play sides that you think you're more likely to beat to get confident, or is it better for us to test ourselves against that upper level to see where the gap is and sort of learn what you learn about players? I think this preseason was was perfect for me. Um, I think that that's the type of preseason that I want to see. I think last season we obviously did well, you know, we won games, but maybe, and yes, and, and we did play Man City, we, we did play Man United, we played Aston Villa, but we're playing teams like PSG and Atletico Madrid who play different styles, they offer, you know, different tactics, different formations, perhaps a different level of physicality or intensity than what you'd get in, in the WSL. I think that's really important to have those different tests. And actually, when you're bringing in players that are European signings, um, playing against teams that have got a mix of European players as well, um, I think is is a good way for them to almost get comfortable in the team. So I like I like the way that we did it. You know, we went away, we played those tougher teams first. So you learn a lot from those teams. You come back, you look at what went well, what didn't go well. And then you play against, you know, more of the kind of the English-based teams that you're used to playing and put into practice what you might have taken away from those different styles that they picked up in Europe. So, um, yeah, I, I was happy with how it went. And, you know, I've heard really good things about Sophie in pre-season in terms of her, you know, um, sort of strike rate and the way that she hits the ball. And that's something that uh, a lot of people have been raving about, actually, you know, the power that she gets on strike and the accuracy in which she sort of um connects with the ball i think is why she's you know she's been so effective as a goal scorer so um sounds like she's built a really nice partnership with with tash flint so i'm excited to see how that sort of develops and yeah i agree with philippa in terms of midfielder for me i think um hobbing hobbinger coming in i can't say her name sorry um <laughs> but i think um i think she would be I, I i think she will be starting games and actually um you know, I'd be interested to that because I think a bit of competition there, actually. Because for me, I think um, Hobbinger, uh, Holland and uh, and Nagano are, are extremely strong midfielders. And I'd love to see those three sort of develop a trio. And and yeah, and if Missy Bow can come in and give them competition and, and rotation, then, then that'd be good. But yeah, I think those connections have been forming in pre-season, but pre-season is pre-season. And I think mm. there's always that huge caveat of, you know, it's... Pre-season is about learning. It's completely different to when to when the season starts. But yeah, in terms, like I say, in terms of what we could get out of it, I, I think I, I'm pretty happy actually. Good, good, good. I mean, in terms of keeping the consistency, you know, we're talking to Philip a lot of uh, you know, exciting new, exciting new players. You know, we're going to see how how his team kicks on. And another key thing for Liverpool is getting the manager signed down for for a bit longer because he's yeah. we we know what he can do, and I just gain. I think that just builds that little continuity. And people don't know who's going to be there, so they know the style of play. I think that sort of relaxes people a bit more. Yeah, I think it kind of just it's weird, really, because I think he was he was coming into his last year of his contract. Um, that was mm. my understanding anyway. Um, so I think it just kind of 
it gives you that stability. I think that's the best way of putting it, where you're going like everybody knows where they stand now. He's you know he's going to be here beyond next summer. Uh, you hope, so long as everything goes well. Um, but I think I think the impressive thing for me is that the club seem to have a clear plan as to what they want to do. You know, they're not kind of. It's probably a criticism of mine. You you always felt like the club didn't really know what direction they were going in and what they wanted to do, and it it really does feel since they've brought Matt in that they've they've kind of had a clear vision. Um, and know what direction they wanted to go in. And, you know, the, the the club for me have invested more this summer than they've ever done before, which I think is a really good sign. Um, I think the move to Melwood is absolutely top draw for the, for the club. Um, I know a lot of people wanted to see us go into um, Kirby, but for me, um, you know, if we'd have gone to Kirby, it would have just been the, the first team that would have been able to go there. There wasn't the room for everybody else. Um, and I just think that that's a, a really solid base for the whole of like the women's setup to basically move on. And, you know, for me, if I was a player, I'd be in absolutely in awe of, of training in that environment and having your own home. Um, you know, to, to basically push us on to that next level, which is what we all want to see. Yeah, yeah. it's from that's a, sorry, from that's a look at the end of it. It makes makes club look more proactive. Whereas yeah. let's be honest, in the past couple of years we've had to we've all been through it, is it almost seems like players leave and managers come down the contract always seem to come across outside looking at it as a bit of a surprise of like, oh yeah, we've got seven play seven players out of contract. Oh our main striker wants to leave. Probably should plan for that really, shouldn't we? Whereas this, as you said, with the Stengel move, they all seem planned in terms of, well, if she goes, this is what we've got planned to, to do. This is how we're going to grow the team. We're going to keep the manager on longer to help develop what we've got. And now we're going to um, we're going to build towards Melwood. It all feels positive, proactive, professional, which to be fair, we haven't accused, you know, in the past, we've been accused of being the complete opposite of that. So again, we've got to give the club credit for going in the right direction and what we want them to do. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think, you know, that that continuity is so important. And, and as Philip was, say, was saying there, sort of planning with Matt Beard, it has, you know, he came in and this was part of the three-year plan. It was, you knew that first season, it was just bringing in a couple of players that you knew could add a bit of experience in the championship to, getting the, to get Liverpool into the WSL. And then once they were in, you know, the top flight, it's then, OK, right, now let's add that quality. Um, and then this season, sort of, you know, the end of the, the kind of the three year plan, it was always Melwood. And that was the big thing. If you've watched any of the interviews that Matt talks about, he's been very open about this from day one, um, getting Liverpool into the training ground. Um, that was his number one priority. And that was Russ Fraser's priority, the director, um, Susan Black as well on, on the on the board. That's, you know, and I understand frustrations. A lot of people have been saying, you know, it's a bit too late or, you know, it's taken so so long. But that was always the plan, you know, within three years, getting them into a training ground. That's done now. Um, and in the meantime, they've managed to, you know, consolidate their place in the WSL. And I actually think last season finishing seventh was a, was a very, very good job considering the injuries that the squad suffered. So um, they're, they're well on track. So I think um, not only is that continuity important, but also I think kind of rewarding Matt for the work he's done so far, I think it's important um, for him and for the club to sort of show that, you know, they're happy with the with the, tra the trajectory in which Liverpool are going. And, and it's at the moment, it's been going steadily upwards, which is what we wanted. You know, we didn't want to suddenly go up and then lose all of the players and then be going back down again and doing a seesaw. It's a gradual build over a period of time so that it's a, a sustainable progression. And that's that's what I think you want, really, in an ideal world. Yeah, definitely. I mean, let's stick with the Melwood piece anyway, because, you know, it, it's, an, it's an iconic in Liverpool's history of Melwood. So I think that also, you know, paints the right picture. But on and off the pitch, that, that has just got to improve the women's team in terms of, off the pitch in terms of attracting players because look at what the facilities you got there you've seen i've seen the media pitch today it, it, you know it's brilliant you know that's what you want that's the sort of environment you want to play football in but also for the current squad this year 
it's given every player the best opportunity to be the best football version of themselves is all the best medical facilities, the best nutrition facilities, you know, the best pitches to play on. And it's governed around when they want to train. It's not fitting in with a around the men's team. It's not fitting in around Tranmere. It is, right, we're going to change it up. We're going to train in the afternoon as of now. That's it. And it, that is what you want them to do, which, you know, there are plenty of other WSL teams that still have those challenges, I would say, of not having their own trains, of having shared facilities. So, I don't know how you feel, Filippo, but, you know, this just feels like the best thing to happen. Yeah, I mean, as Emma says, like, I've known for a couple of years that they were looking to to kind of build their own training facilities for the women's um, set up. Um, you know, we always knew that, you know, if the club could have turned back the clock, you know, that they would have tried to do something with Melwood. Um, and it was just whether or not they could get that back over the line again. I think it is massively important um, for the club because it's showing that they're actually serious about the women's side as well. You know, when if we just rewind like three seasons, because that's all it is since we, you know, we were in the championship and we got relegated. You know, at that point, everybody was criticising the club for how little they were investing, the fact that they dropped the ball, the fact that they, they weren't really interested in the women's side. Um, and I think it just shows that actually the club and the owners, they are interested, they are wanting to invest, they do want to be successful in the women's game. But you can't go from basically being relegated to then just winning the WSL at the drop of a hat. It has to be a gradual um, phase in. You know, we've even seen with Manchester United, who I think they only started with their women's side five years ago or six years ago, um, you know, they came up through the championship and it's took them a little bit of time to get up there and feel like they're really able to compete at the very top of the table. You know, they were like fourth or fifth for a couple of seasons, but, you know, it's only really now that you can see that they're actually right up there. Um, you know, and I, I hear noises that, you know, not all the players are happy with the, the facilities that they've got for the women's side at Man United either. So, you know, I I hope that what this also does is it shows other clubs the way to go, um, mm. you know, to treat the women's side just as important as the men's, to give them the facilities to be able to be the best versions of themselves um, because that's what the players, you know, deserve. You know, and having facilities like that, I'm hoping as well it will help stave off these ACL injuries, you know, the, the influx of these different injuries that the, the women's players seem to get. And I... Obviously, I've not done any particular research in it, and I know that the you know the anatomy of a female body is different to a male body, but I can't help but feel that that training on substandard pitches, playing on substandard pitches, also you know contributes to how many injuries that the women's sides get. So I hope, um, you know, obviously I'm pleased at the moment that Liverpool seem to be one of the clubs that's doing this, but I hope more and more clubs, uh, you know take a similar stance and, and give the, the female teams similar sort of facilities. Yeah, well said. Well, said. well let's step away from a little bit. Let's just talk a bit about the wider concept of women's football because um, we also have the World Cup. Um, Emma, obviously you were there, yeah. you know, so what's, you know, obviously we've known for, for quite a while, you know, what was it like, you know, being at a World Cup, you know, from a journalistic kind of fans perspective because, you know, you pretty much lived down, down in Oz and, and New Zealand for a little while. It was... From what I saw, you quite enjoyed yourself. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing. I had my first World Cup experience um, with the men's one back in back in November, and that was a bit of a whirlwind because it was just all about me sort of experiencing a an abroad major tournament for the first time. Because before that, I'd only done you know the home women's Euros the summer before, so um, it's just completely different dealing with things like time difference and yeah, and obviously you know sort of foreign cultures and sort of time yeah like I said time difference is a big thing but also languages and um different sort of um nations and their fans and all that kind of stuff and yeah navigating public transport so just like the day-to-day -day of it is just you know it's just something else so um but it's, it's great fun it's intense it's exhausting but it's um yeah it's it was great fun and obviously for me to to be able to report on England in a World Cup final was um if I'm being honest it was a dream come true really so um highlight of my career and unless 
I covering them winning a World Cup. <laughs> um, nothing will ever beat that, really. Um, so, yeah, on a personal level, obviously a lot of pride and a lot of enjoyment out of it. But, um, yeah, I just think it was such such a good tournament. And to be in Australia, I was based in Sydney for, the you know, the bulk of it. Um, I was following, you know, the England team around. So I was in Brisbane and Adelaide as well, but mainly in Sydney and um, the Australians absolutely threw everything at the tournament. I think huge credit to the hosts, um, New Zealand as well, obviously. Um, I think they were phenomenal, not just in terms of the organisation and the work that the, the, their federations put into women's football and, and the tournament itself, but also, you know, the, the local businesses, the fans and the players themselves that really took on the tournament, I just thought was was excellent. So a real joy to be in Sydney and um yeah, that, that Australia England semi final was one of the greatest matches that I've I've ever watched live and, and been a part of. So memories for a lifetime, I think. How do you find it, Philip? I the England Australia I had to listen to that on, on the radio because I was driving on a holiday, which is quite quite stressful. Yeah. Yeah. Um I mean the, the only thing for me was obviously of it being halfway across the world was the, the, the time difference. Mm. So you know, you miss a lot of the games, but, um, you know, I, I saw a lot of the Euros last summer um, and I think the biggest compliment I can can pay them is that it seemed to level up, um, mm. which is great. Um, you know, I thought England did a fantastic job um, with the Euros, um, but I think kind of Australia and New Zealand took kind of like that wave that was created within the women's game after the Euros and they ran with it. Um, it was an absolute fantastic tournament. Um, the absolute pinnacle um, of the women's game, in my opinion. Um, you know, you can make the arguments in the men's game as to to what the pinnacle is, but I think it was clear that, that the World Cup is the absolute pinnacle of the women's mm. game. And, you know, you saw world stars game after game, um, new stars coming through as well um, that you maybe weren't on your radar before. Um, Cooney Cross, who's someone who people can watch in the WSL this season for, for Arsenal as well. Um, you know, those sorts of players who who you maybe haven't heard of before, but you know, everybody knows them now. Um, and I think that's the biggest compliment you can play, pay both the players, um, and also the spectacle of the occasion as well. I think you know, there was very few. Um, dull games, I would say. Every single game that I, I watched, it was it was intense, it was competitive, um, and the quality was was second to none. Um, I think we've we've seen the development of the women's game over the past ten years has has absolutely gone on a trajectory that I don't think I've seen in any other sport um, on a world stage. I think uh, I think it's phenomenal, really, how how quickly it's grown. Um, and let's hope we can keep this going um, over the next few tournaments as well. I think also is sort of the the operational side of it, it is something the men can learn from is simple things. And this is the thing I've been screaming about in the men's game for is how many times did the, did the ref go to the screen and connect it to the tannoy to everyone the same when penalty number eight. You knew straight away. You know, yeah, that it's... alone is you may have been to games at Anfield. It's so maddening when you have to like look on Twitter to go. What's he checking the bar thing? Why, why yeah. is that? Is it an offside? Is it? Is it a penalty? What's it for? Whether you agree with the decision or not is a, is a completely different matter. We could all start that debate. But at least that's clear. At least then yeah. everyone knew it. Oh, okay. They've said handball against number ten. Then you may watch the replay and go, "That's harsh." Or you don't agree. But everyone in the stadium knows what's going on. That's right. It makes it part of the spectacle. It's part of the events of football. Is you know what it's been given for. You know, that alone is clearly a test they're doing and it works. And I don't know why something like that isn't going to be eventually brought into all parts of professional football because it just makes it clear for everyone inside the stadium or on telly what's going on. I yeah. think that alone what made life easier. Yeah, I mean I think I think within the men's game, my my biggest thing is you benefit more, I think, of from watching on TV because you can see clearly mm. what they're looking at and you know you've got the commentators who are for whatever reason the commentators get to to hear what's being said and what they're checking um but you don't get to find out when you're in the stadium um 
I would actually take it a step further again. And I would say that we should be able to hear the conversations between VAR and the referee to hear exactly what's, you know, going on, what the thought process is. Um, I still think we've got a little bit of a way to go into getting the perfect um, experience for the fan. Um, but yeah, I think to to be honest, like if if I wanted to compare both games, I would say the respect that both the officials have for the players and the players have for the officials in the women's game is far far better than what it is in the men's game. Um, and I think you know maybe that's something that they can learn from. Um, but I. Yeah, I, I don't think it was perfect in the World Cup, but it was definitely better finding out in the stadium, you know, what the decision was and why they were giving it. Yeah, I thought I thought so. Um, the challenging side of, that we're seeing at the moment from outside looking in, in international football is, I've always found that the scheduling is just wild, I find at times. I find it genuinely wild that you have a full pre-season, you play six to eight games, and then a week before the season starts, right, we'll do internationals. It just seems maddening. And now we've seen, I think, Liverpool's new striker has broken, I think she's broken her nose. Might be, a, mm. a, 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 it's pretty much out of the Arsenal game. Um, poor uh, Caroline Weir, I think it's been announced today, has hurt her ACL. So that's another, I mean, that's another ongoing problem in the women's game, a lot of ACL injuries. But it just seems a very bizarre time to do international breaks before. So like, and like you said, for Arsenal, doing qualifiers for the Champions League where some players are getting that six days rest. You know, yeah. it kind of feels like you're almost like pushing players to get injured. And I'm not saying there's, there's no perfect way of doing a schedule. There isn't because, you know, whatever schedule you do, some will pick a hole in it, you know, people like me, you know. But this, this for the beginning of the season, I just find maddening. I've never understood it. But, you know, maybe that's because I'm looking at it at the wrong angle. Um, but it just seems odd. At the moment. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think it is that. I think the bigger problem is the Champions League qualifiers, actually, for me, than the international break. I think both are an issue, but you know, to have a Champions League qualifier less than what was it, two, two and a half weeks after a World Cup final is absolutely ridiculous. Um, that for me is just an absolute no brainer. You just, you just don't do it then. <laughs> um, I think I can understand it from. So the FA's point of view in terms of the date of starting the WSL, they're obviously reacting to the FIFA calendar and it would make no sense to have an opening weekend of the WSL and then a week later then go on international break again. So I can see why, you know, they've waited to start the WSL in October. That to me makes sense. But in an ideal world, you wouldn't have a scenario where FIFA are put in an international window in October. Obviously, the Women's Nation, the uh, sorry, in, in September, the, the Women's Nations League is obviously a new a new tournament, but I think it's it's good. It gets rid of international friendlies. I prefer it. If you're going to have an international break, at least make it competitive. But that obviously adds another element to it as well, because you're likely to not rotate, because obviously you're going to be playing your best side. Serena Beekman admitted that. You know, she's not she's not someone that rotates much anyway. Right. Um, but you know, if it had been a friendly, she might have maybe switched around. At, a few other players um, tried out a few little things, but you're not going to do that when you're trying to qualify for the Olympics. It's just yeah. completely out of the question. You play your best team. Um, so that's another element. Um, one thing I do think is interesting, though, I had this conversation with Izzy Christiansen, actually, who obviously retired at the end of last season, former Everton captain. She turned around and said that, um, you know, the WSL should make the, the winter break far shorter which on paper people might think is mad because you're then giving players less time off. I actually 100% agree with her because I think what you then do is you spread the games in the season across a, a longer period. So rather than having, I think at the moment, um, I might be wrong and eat an, you know have the schedule in front of me, but I think it's about three weeks that most clubs have around Christmas time. I remember last season you looked at Liverpool and because Liverpool were out of certain cup competitions by kind of February time, there was a period where you know, they went sort of two and a half weeks without a game. Then they had three in one week and then they didn't play again for another two weeks. Yeah. It's that, that is just as much risk to injury as playing, you know, five games in, in two weeks. So I think that's something that has to be addressed. So if you get rid of the, the winter break, 
you can then spread these matches so you can have one one match a week or you can have two matches a week over a period of time instead of having a condensed period where you've got more and more games because they've got to factor in a three-week break where nobody's playing anything. So um, I would prefer that. You know, I prefer teams to be playing regularly but sustainably rather than te- teams playing loads all in one go. They're not playing for ages and playing loads all in one go again. Um, but every organisation needs, needs to get together. You know, UEFA, FIFA, the FA, um, governing bodies elsewhere across Europe in particular, they need to get together and really look at the schedule. And that's obviously going to take time. And when you're adding in new competitions and you're looking at the Women's Champions League, you're looking at the Nations League, etc., um, it's not going to be a quick fix, but it's, yeah, it's an issue. And I think everyone everyone can see that. I suppose if you did um, Izzy's suggestion, that also helps for the amount of games you have called off in January. Yeah. Because of frozen pitches, which always leads to condensing. It gives you that almost like a couple of buffer weeks, which is you likely are going to have a game called off at some point for bad weather. It, it happens every January. You know, yeah. we, we see it all the time. But at least then you're not doing three games, six days. So again, it gives you that bit of a, a buffer. So also, it also helps keep decent crowds up because also that can also be a difficulty for families. And is three games? It's the, you've got three home games in a week. There's only so many games you can go to. You have time at work, things like that. So that nobody also wants to go to Crandon Park when it's absolutely freezing and it's icy and it's snowy. <laughs> so yeah, if you can play more games, but but genuinely though, you're right. If you you know if you time it where actually when you're having a short break is when a lot of games are likely to get cancelled anyway then that makes mm. a lot more sense. And then yeah. if you're playing more games on the other side of that sort of window where it's it's not freezing, crowds are going to be higher and there's less risk of cancelling games and that obviously makes sense as well. Yeah, no, no one likes... No, everyone's sick of going to spread the power of a blanket just to make sure he gets through <laughs> the game. You know, the amount of time I t- wrap my door in a blanket go, come on, stay awake, this is what we come for. <laughs> it's great. It's, it's, a nil, it, it's nil nil with West Ham. Can't wait. This is brilliant. <laughs> you, know, you kind of, you know, you also want to make it enjoyable because it's not enjoyable sitting there freezing, going cold. Yeah. So, okay, Pete. So let's go back to WSL world though, because the fixed computer has been kind to us. We've got Arsenal away, Villa at home, and Everton at home. Which I think, checking my checking my notes, we got a grand total of zero points from last season. So this is definitely a chance to early start to, you know, try and build on last season. Arsenal away is going to be hard fill up it's going to be a big event you know because i mean the emirates is going to be very very busy which is what you want you want to see the women's teams playing in in, in the, the bigger stadiums you know atmosphere will be great it'd be interesting what side matt beard picks because it sounds like i think sophie's probably going to be out of that game I mean, hopefully she's back for villa but how have you sort of seen sort of arsenal away yeah i mean like i said before i'd be I'm not really banking on us getting anything from that game. What I want to see is us be competitive. Um, I felt in both games last season against Arsenal, they were probably the one side that we struggled the most against. Um, I think that they were comfortably the better side against us. Mm. Uh, We really struggled to get a grip in both games, both at home and away. Um, So I think, you know, just showing a bit more... um, kind of going forward for me. Um, it was like we were frightened of them a little bit and kind of just sat off them and allowed them to to basically pepper our goal, really. Um, so, yeah, I think I, I want us to stay in the game for a lot longer, um, particularly the away game. I felt we were, you know, we were pretty much out of the game within like the first 20 minutes. And, you know, that's not something that I want to see this time. Um but I think beyond that, um, you know, I've I think I've classed it as a really tough start again, um, for the exact same reason what you said there, Chris. The amount of points that we got from these games last season um, was zilch. Um, but I think I I expect Villa to be strong. Um, mm. But I thought last season we did pretty well against Villa. Um, so if we can build on that a little bit this season, particularly at home at Prenton Park. I don't see anything why we can't take something from that game. Um, I think it may depend on who we've got available up front. You know, if if Sophie Roman Hogg is, is available, I think that'll be a big boost to us. Um, and then Everton, you know, last season when we played at Anfield, for me, we just completely froze on the occasion. Um, yeah. You know, it just... 
I don't know. It just seemed a bit too much for us. Uh, maybe it was going from the championship. We were playing in front of a few hundred people every week to then going into to Anfield in front of 30,000 people was just a bit too much. Um, so hopefully they're a bit more used to that from having played a few games last season in front of much bigger crowds. Um, and that'll stand them in good stead for, for this derby. And I mean, to be honest, I, I see more of the, the game at Goodison as being a bit of a barometer because... You know, I thought we were excellent in that game. Yeah. We were unlucky to, yeah. to not come away with the three points. Um, I'm still, I'm still raging. <laughs> I'm still raging of that road goal disallowed. I'm just, yeah, still exactly. To this day, can't work out why it's disallowed. <laughs> exactly. So, um, you know, I don't see any reason why, you know, the team can't put in a much better performance at Anfield this time and and hopefully come away with at least a point. But I'm, I'm hoping for free, if I'm honest. I, I really want us to... Uh, to, to beat Everton for the first time in a long time, I think in the women's game, and uh, I, I'm really targeting yeah. that one as. Uh, I don't. I don't think we've beaten Everton when we played at Anfield for the women's team, which no. is really, no. really depressing. That's really depressing. And so, the one positive I say, Emma, is more from the Goodison game was there was a similar amount of hype around it and press attention, you know, for the side derby, but playing at one of the men's stadiums. But I felt Liverpool handled that. Better second time, second time around. So, you'd like to think they, they would learn from what didn't quite go right first time around with the occasion and the you know, the build around it. And the, look, there'll be a big build around this again, you know, hoping for like a, a big, big crowd again at Anfield. So, we kind of want to see that as a barometer because it'd just be nice to, try to get a performance level out of it. Because we, if we performed at Anfield like we did at Goodison, you know, Liverpool will give Everton a real scare. And, you know, like Philip said, we we're very unlucky not to win at Goodison. Yeah, well, I just think the players were more experienced by that time, not just in terms of the occasion, but also in terms of how to play in the WSL and how to manage games. Um, you know, you look back to the, obviously the you know the derby at Anfield, and I completely agree with Philippa in that. Yeah, that I think they were completely overawed by the occasion, but I also think it was a bit of an experience. So, for example, when they went a goal down early on, they kind of lost their heads a little bit. Whereas, you know, we saw them concede goals and go down 1-0 and then you know as the season went on they sort of learned how to kind of then be patient and work their way back into games and I think that's a mixture of experience but also obviously dealing with the occasion so um and look the teams the teams are different this season you know and yeah you referenced it before I put out my predictions today I had I thought you know Everton a lot of people sort of were surprised at me predicting them to do so well last season and, and you know I, I was really impressed with them in pre-season and they went on and, and had a really strong season which I wasn't overly surprised about this season you know people have been quite surprised that I've, I've gone the other way and, and that's just because I think they've lost some key players in defence and I think they've lost leaders as well you know their captains retired Gabby George who was another part of that leadership group has gone and signed for Manchester United so um that those type of players and those type of profile of players are really important in things like Merseyside derbies. So it'll be interesting to see how, you know, Everton react to kind of their squad changes. They've got some European players in as well. You know, are they used to playing in kind of crowds like that and maybe hostile atmospheres like that? It'll be interesting to see. Um, and then Liverpool have obviously, you know, got some new players in and lost some players as well. So Personally, I'm. It's cliche, but I'm kind of along the lines of the managers. I just I think anything that happened last season is kind of irrelevant in my in my eyes. Um, the team has developed so much, and they've gained so much more experience since both of those games. Really, that um, I just think it's going to be completely different this time. Like the scoreline might be the same, you know, in terms of who comes out on top might be the same, but um, I think the actual football itself is is just going to be completely different. Philippa, out. Do you reckon that is the worst thing you have to do as a journalist? Is either player ratings or preseason predictions? I, yeah. I, please tell me you put your Twitter on just um, no replies. <laughs> <laughs> just that. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, obviously, my husband's an Evertonian. Um, we do know. He, we do know. He, he mentioned it to me. Should we say? <laughs> um, but I mean, this is this is a problem, isn't it? You do an opinion piece, and literally, people don't take into account it is just your opinion the fact that they've got a different one is fine you know mm. um but it to is be fair, I've, I've not really got much stick for it i'll be honest like I've, yeah I've, yeah 
I've not got much at all. Like I've had I've had a couple of you know a couple of people disagree, but I've actually not. It's been nice. Like I've had nice conversations. Like last season, and I think this is maybe where people are starting to develop as well in the WSL is that people are now watching games and they're getting a bit more knowledge. Whereas last mm. season, you know, you just you just have fans who assume that their team should be winning. I remember last season a lot of Liverpool fans being like you know, why haven't you predicted Liverpool to win the WSL? And I think that's, you know, and that's, I'm not being disrespectful to them. I'm just, I think that's maybe just a bit of a lack of knowledge about the game. But now that, yeah. you know, supporters that are maybe, you know, used to watching their men's team, you know, that have been successful on the men's side or the opposite, not successful on the men's side, it might be the completely different story with their women's team. And I think people are now starting to to get a little bit more knowledgeable so it's 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 good to have those conversations so yeah um yeah it was it was actually not too bad but yeah i had a couple of a uh, couple of comments from the Evertonians <laughs> in particular yeah it's it's all um, good natured i think in the women's game yeah. uh, in the main so um i think i think exposure as well just what you're saying there emma you know the fact that there's women's games on on the tv every week now i think that helps people gaining yeah. the knowledge of the game and you know who's good who isn't good who's you know struggling a little bit and um you know I, th I think it's only it's only going to get better as well the more the more the game develops and, and the more matches that are on the tv you know the more people are going to get involved and and know what they're talking about um I mean five years ago I didn't know what I was talking about in the women's game and look at me now I still don't yeah, yeah, yeah. me neither and, <laughs> and I know and I know even less as you two both now as <laughs> But even I've seen that development. Uh, I think when I started doing oh, trippers, this is, must be like three years ago. Uh, it was like a passing comment, you know, because I was at the games going, "Are oh, the women have won today?" Or you know, this this short's gone that way. Whereas now I'm, I, oh no, we have like a Telegram group which is for like our subscribers. I'm jumping, getting private messages going. So who is this person we've bought? Or what? Well, I've heard this person quite good. Or you know, Winsley and Kane and back. You know, there's just genuine interest now. Of like, I kind of want to know what's going on, which is good because that's kind of what. You want it to be, you know, and I think there was always a perception that if women's football wasn't for you, fine, it's not for you. you just leave it at that. But people are now just sort of going like, look how I see it, which is football's football. As long as you enjoy it, you know, yeah. what's the difference? You know, it's just you're there to enjoy it. You know, as Philip has seen, you know, I get more stressed at women's games than anything. You know, yeah, you, uh, you endure I, it rather than enjoy it. <laughs> I do. I do. I have the roller coaster. Um, so, but you know, that's just the way. That's the way it is. But, but I kind of, I kind of like. I said, I don't get to go to many of the men's games live. Oh, just, if you didn't make men's game, pretty simple. Um, enjoying it rather than enjoying it, so I can't, <laughs> can't undo that part of my psyche. But that's what it is, because you know, it's what it, what you want with your family. And you know, there's no more. It's no different to the men's game in terms of how the fan fans react and just come sit next to me or Philip, but you'll see how we react <laughs> when things don't go our way. It's, it's a Blue the blues by the best way, isn't it? The, the, yeah. the referees don't have to get some stick from me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yeah, yeah. We will we will go on that too because that's yeah, that's fine. So they're gonna so, be great this season, they're gonna be great. That's about that far either. <laughs> um, so Philip, what your what you sort of what's your dream season? And what do you think's realist realistic? My dream season's top half, fifth or mm -hmm. sixth. I think I think anything beyond that would be a, a real stretch. Um, I think even getting fifth um, with the, you know, Aston Villa, who were really impressive last season and they've they've made Retreat even more well, signings yeah. for this season. Um, so I think anything top half would be great. Um, I wouldn't be too disappointed with seven, four, eighth, I'll be honest. Um, I think there really is a clump of teams in that middle of the table that literally they can finish in any order. Um, and I think if a disaster for me would be ninth downwards, I would say. Um, I think you know we we really need to be above that now. If we're if we're progressing from last season, you know we don't even need to, or we shouldn't even be thinking about being in a relegation scrap. You know, for a huge part of last season, we were in that scrap um, until you know January February time when we managed to get ourselves away from it. I think. This season, we should be saying we're not even going to be part of that conversation. Um, and let's see where it takes us. Um, I think getting more points than last season uh, would be a really good season for us. 
and it gives us that base then again to build on it again next season as as Emma was saying it's about that trajectory for me and it's it's just steadily going in that direction um so no steps back please cool cool well right, you have, I know you predicted seventh in your um prediction thing but obviously that, that's sort of like with your journalistic realistic head on which it makes sense where you're particular but what would be the dream season obviously we also win win the league but you know a realistic dream season yeah I, i'm exactly the same same as philippa i mean to put it simply i think um fifth would be incredible sixth i'd be very happy with i think seventh i'd be happy with i think that would be mm. a good season if they get more points than they did last year or at least maybe showed a bit of progression um in terms of you know building a bit more of a gap between maybe seventh and, and eighth i'd be yeah any of those three positions so fifth amazing sixth great seventh good anything below that i think would be slightly disappointing and then downwards like philippa i think if liverpool are, are involved in a relegation battle um that for me would be a, a disappointing season so yeah any anything above seventh i'd, I'd be really happy with Cool. My hope is for a couple of away wins would be quite nice because we, yeah. we didn't get into last year, so that'd be one way of getting up to fifth or sixth. Yeah. Quite like a cup run. I don't think I've ever seen Liverpool have a cup run. Not for years. It'd be quite, well, it'd be they, quite nice. They did get to the quarterfinals last year, didn't they? Which I thought was all right. Yeah, the League Cup. I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't think the draw's being kind to us. No, um, no, it never is, is it? <laughs> That's well, I, to be honest, last season, the League Cup, we did have a kind draw, and I think that's why we got so far in it. Yeah. This season, I mean... We're in there with the top sides in, in the WSL. Um, and unfortunately, it seems to be that you have one group in the north that's pretty good and one group that's like you, any one of two or three can basically top that group. Um, so I'd be surprised if we get out of the group this year. Um, and that won't be because we'll have underperformed. It's just because of the teams that we're in and up against. Um yes. But the FA Cup as well. I mean, it'd be nice to try and avoid Chelsea for a change, yeah. won't we? Um, you know, we might be able to get on a bit of an FA Cup run if we if we avoid the top yeah. side. I mean, probably don't avoid Chelsea and then end up getting Arsenal. That would be just as well. Bad. Well, yeah. I mean, can we can we just leave the top sides alone for a bit? Yeah, <laughs> yeah try else, and get us to, to the quarter. Because else get them for a change. Yeah, be nice. just be nice. just because it just again it all but also extends the season. It helps you give your squad a bit more game time, and that's also how we develop really so you know because i'm intrigued to see the competition and how how this team develops but i'm looking forward to, look forward to this obviously we'll be there that's a part of the villa game won't we and the uh, the arsenal game is on the it's on the fa player isn't it I yes it televi- i don't think it's televised yeah, it's, it's in the fa player exactly. isn't it so so we go from there yeah. cool and tickets are still available for the derby as i think it's a tenner tenner for adults and a quid for kids so you know if you want an opportunity to go to anfield here's your here's your opportunity and it's always a good game. The Derby's always a good game. What more can you want? You know, bit of bit of shouting and screaming, hopefully make the Blues cry. It'd be quite quite a nice way to start the season. <laughs> so obviously not in your household. We, you know, we possibly don't let you hear that bit. But you know. Oh no, no, we'll let him cry. <laughs> Savage. Brilliant. Savage. Right. On that happy note, um, Philip, anything else from you before we go? No, I don't think so. I think we've covered everything there. Good, good, good. Emma, any new articles coming out soon? Oh, there's loads. I can't even list them. It's opening um, weekend of the WSL, isn't there? There's features left, right, and centre coming out my ears. I'm about to go finish another one now. So um just okay. just just check the check the website. There's loads on there. <laughs> yeah, go on. make sure make sure you plug your Twitter address, come on, so people can get 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 a handle in your Oh, I always forget this. Um E M underscore Sandy with a Y. There we go. So because yeah. Emma is extremely modest. Uh, but make sure you read Emma's <laughs> stuff, it's really good. That's basically how I learn what's going on with the WSL because that's <laughs> the best, best way to know, ask the experts, isn't it? Cool. Until then, thanks so much for both of you to join us. We'll have you back very, very soon. Until then, take care. Mm-hmm.